Hello there, and welcome to Women's Business. My name is Dr. Mary Michelle Cross Smith, known to most as Dr. Daycare, and this is my co host, Amy Vogel. We would like to welcome you to our mentoring program designed to educate our community on issues facing working women. We will be speaking to our guests in the areas of art, sciences, health, education, law, medicine, politics, community service, military, and business. The goal of the show is to provide information that comes only from personal experience and to pass this information down to our daughters, nieces, neighbors, family, and friends. Much of the content will relate to the guest speaker's journey in their profession, what they have learned most about this process, and what they wished they had known before this journey began. Since women-owned businesses are the fastest growing sector of our economy, my guests will close with what lesson they would like to pass on to the viewing audience. Thank you for joining me on Women's Business. I am honored to welcome Kelly Nevins from the Women's Fund of Rhode Island. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Great. I'm so glad you're here. So tell me a little bit about the mission of the Women's Fund. Sure. Our mission is to invest in women and girls through research, advocacy, and strategic partnerships designed to eliminate gender inequity through systemic change. It's a lot of words Okay, there. now you, you yeah. definitely have got to get <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> Break that down That's for me. That's the mission. Help me Absolutely. Out. Help me out. Absolutely. Tell me, so, tell me what you really do. <laughs> uh, so we do invest in women and girls in Rhode Island, and Whoa. one of the ways that we do this is through understanding what the status of women and girls are in our state. Mm -hmm. So um, recently, the Women's Fund of Rhode Island put out the Status of Working Women Report in Rhode Island. Where have I been all these years? I was a working <laughs> yeah. woman for 44 years. Sure, sure. So what this report does is it looks at who, which women are working, which women aren't working, and if they want to be working, what's preventing them from working as much or in the fields that they want to be working in. Um, because we know that uh, there are a lot of different challenges that that women experience in the workplace or even getting to the workplace. And so part of what we do is understanding what those challenges are and then finding ways to remove those barriers. And so that's where advocacy comes in. So these um, women's fund, do they do this? This, this uh, so, uh, we, Is that part of your mission? Is it this? is. Um, so this particular set of research, we actually funded. We didn't do the original okay, research yeah, ourselves. Yeah. We we outsourced it to the Economic Progress Institute oh, of sure, Rhode Island. Absolutely. Yep. Great program. Um, but uh, some research we have done on our own. Uh, we have been around since 2001, and almost every year we've put out a different research report on on some aspect of the status of women in Rhode Island. So if you were to uh, visit our website, we, we have a research page where you could access research that we have done since 2001 on the status of women. Wow. Um, and, and really, that's it just sets a baseline for us in terms of, okay, this is where women are at. And again, part of our role is to eliminate gender discrimination. So where do we, where do we measure up against the men in our community and not as a way of male bashing or we hate men no, or anything good, like that's that? That's a very good point. We don't want to call it male bashing. Right. Because sometimes when you get in a, a, we just came off a nice long weekend, you get in these family conversations, a friend's conversation, it's like, oh, you're just a woman. Men bashing, like, right? No, right. We're having no, no, no. a conversation. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's it's to really just be able to measure up where women are versus men in our state, and if there are inequities, being able to identify what those inequities are and find ways to address them positively. So again, I mentioned that part of our work so is- So where are women compared to men in our state? Okay, so- Good uh, old state of Rhode Island. <laughs> good old state of Rhode Island. Just from the wage inequity piece, because that's what yes, people know yeah. best. Um, in Rhode Island, women make, eight, white women make 88 cents on the male dollar, okay? Um, and there are a variety of reasons why women might not make as much as men. Um, the good news, I guess, is that women in Rhode Island uh, ha have a much smaller wage gap 
than in other parts of the country. Really? But the bad news is the reason for that is because men's wages have gone down in Rhode Island, not because women's wages have oh, gone up. Okay. Um, and I mentioned that that's white women's wages. When you start comparing women of color and their, their uh, wages that they make, it's significantly different. A black woman will make 77 cents on a white woman's dollar and a, a Latina woman will make under 50 cents on the white woman's dollar. Oh. So when we think about economic security. Why do you think that is? Well, so there are a variety of different reasons, a variety. Number one, uh, there are the, the types of work that women traditionally get into. Yes. Um, so traditionally women, uh, whether they've been enculturated towards this or they, they weren't pushed towards higher paying uh, jobs uh, tend to take office jobs, tend to take caregiving jobs, tend to take teaching jobs, all of which are much lower paid than what a lot of men would take. So that's, that's part of it. Um, even when women take higher paid jobs, when they start to get into what we call the STEM career path, your yeah. science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering, and math, right from the get-go, right from when they graduate college, when they don't even have kids yet, women still are making less than men. Uh, there, are, there are national studies that show that just coming out of college, women are offered less money. And so part of that issue, again, is culturally related. It's women aren't taught to negotiate. Um, we're taught, oh, oh you know, that, I, that's I'm, interesting. I'm, Negotiations. I'm, I'm so thankful that you're giving me a job and I, you know, I should be happy with what's given to it's part of what we grow up with. We should be nice, right? <laughs> I'm a woman from the 50s. Is that what my parents told me? My uh -huh. very first job. You should be so glad they gave you a job. Exactly. I was like exactly. 16 years old. I'm like, I am. Thank you. So, You're so there's sense that, Yeah. So there's that. Of course, there's the so-called mommy track. You know, women okay. start to make money and then... Traditionally, in our culture, women are the ones who stay home and take care mm -hmm. of the girl, uh, mm -hmm. the the kids. Now, that's not. It, some of that is changing. Men are starting to take paternity leave, yes. but traditionally, it happens more often to women, and therefore, they step out of their career track and their wages stop from that time period. Employers may also look at women who are just entering the workforce and may say, oh, I'm not going to invest as much in her because she's likely to stay home with kids. I'd rather invest in, in the male because I, I know he'll be around for a while. So, so there, there are lots of so different issues. Are still in place yeah, absolutely. 2017. Yeah, wow. absolutely. Now, um, the other for me, concerning piece of this research shows that we still in Rhode Island have far too many young women who are not graduating from high school. Okay. Um, and in fact, 35% of Latina women don't have a high school diploma. 28% wow. of our Asian women in Rhode Island don't have a high school diploma. Wow. We've heard the governor say several times this year about how most jobs require a bachelor's degree. Yeah. So we have got to do more to get young women to stay in school. Maybe they're not wanting to go to college, but at least get them through a certificate program that might get them a good job with benefits. So some of the other challenges that are in place and here. how do you get um, the woman to stay in school? Well, so these are the types of things that when we say we invest in women and girls, part of our mission is as a grant maker. We make oh, grants wow. to other organizations that are addressing just those types of issues. How can we keep mm -hmm. women of color, girls of color, low, uh, low economic students in school so that we can give them the tools that they need just to get started? Um, we, we need them to get started. So part of what we do is, again, that, that, uh, that grant making piece. Um, also part of what we do is we try and look at the things that uh, would help women to be better prepared from an economic standpoint. So what we've talked about with the wage piece, um, we've talked that women make less than men on, in aggregate. However, there is more of a percentage of women who make minimum wage. Sometimes uh, 
they work a couple of minimum wage jobs. Did you know that over 40% of women in our state are the, the wealth earners for their families? They're the ones who are bringing mm -hmm. in money for their families. 21% uh, are also doing this with a, a partner of some kind, but 41% are single mothers, who many of which are working for minimum wage without benefits. So when we talk about advocacy, we're actually talking about how do we help women to get benefits, even for the minimum wage jobs? What if we could get paid sick time for parents? And that helps both women what and do you men. you paid sick time as? Do you have, like, do you have like a formula in your mind? Uh, so uh, we are at the Women's Fund partnered with a number of organizations mm -hmm. around the state that are trying to pass get a bill yep. passed, a law passed for earned sick time that is based on the amount of hours that you work. Mm -hmm. But all employees would be entitled up to, based on their percentage of time that they're putting up, a, a maximum of seven days a year of earned sick time. The idea is that you know everybody gets sick and even if you choose to go to work sick, if you're a single mom and your kids are homesick, what do you do? You stay home, you take care of your, your sick kids, mm -hmm. you're not getting paid. You potentially are gonna get fired because mm -hmm. you didn't show up at work. Um, so how do we help these people not to end up then on getting food stamps, on having to get public benefits? If we give them a couple of earned sick days a year to help take care of these minor things, that can help things in the long run. Do a number in Rhode Island? Of, I, I, am I hearing you, because I'm an employer, mm -hmm. I, I run child care centers, so all of my employees get paid time off. That's great. Yeah, so you're saying there's a number of employers there who do not give their employees any time at absolutely. all? Absolutely, absolutely. Wow. Yes, uh, they're, yes, absolutely. So uh, again, some of the things that we are working on are, are through advocacy. Mm -hmm. So we do research, we advocate, we do grant making, yeah. and then we also have some programs in place at the Women's Fund that, I, again, really look at life through a gender lens and say, how do we focus on these to help women and to become more successful. One of the things that we know, well, let me back up for a minute. The United States is number 45 out of 144 developed countries wow. on the gender equity index. The gender equity index looks at things like wage parity, yeah. but also at leadership. You know, who, who are the women in government? Who are the women who are leading businesses? It looks at health indicators. It looks at education levels. So here, the great United States, we should be in the top 10, right? We, we should. <laughs> I, I totally agree. Right. We're number 45, okay? So um, one of the- that? Well, because we're not meeting these, these equity levels that okay. I talked about. All right. So uh, part of the programs that we are getting involved in at the Women's Fund have to do with getting more women in leadership, oh, and okay. in particular, in political leadership. So this summer, we're leading a program that's, call, uh, that's called Run As You Are, and basically, it's to inspire women to run for office. You know how they say it takes seven times for you to sell something to somebody? Yeah, it does. Well, it takes seven times to get women to think about running for office. Men don't even think about it. Somebody says to a man, you should run for office. Okay, I'll run. He, yeah, okay, I run. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, men have to figure out the time in their life. They, right. they got to figure out their family. Uh, they got to figure out their income. Right, they gotta right, figure right. Out if they're smart enough. Exactly. I'm a woman who ran for office. Okay, <laughs> well, see, there you go. So I can come up with those things really quickly. The next thing you know, you're 50-something. Yeah. Now I'm running out of time. I need right, to do this, right? Right. But it'd be great if you can get 30-year-olds. Absolutely. Like, I mean, that's a great age, 30, 40. So, so, right. so what we know is that when you have 30% or more women in a room yeah. of leaders, that things begin to change for women and families really? for the better. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what political party they're part of. They that's could right. be Republican, Absolutely. they could be Democratic, yep. they could be independent. The fact that it's by the mere fact that there are more women present in the room that things start to change for the better. Oh. Now, the good news is in Rhode Island at our state legislature level, mm -hmm. we have, we're over that 30% threshold. However, when we look to our towns, our, our school boards, uh, you know, all of the local uh, uh, areas for legislators, there's definitely not enough women who are running for office. Mm -hmm. So we're working to change that. 
We're also training women on how to become policy advocates. So we have what we call a Women's Policy Institute. And this teaches women the process of how a bill becomes a law and then gets them involved in saying, we want something to change for the better. Here's the thing that we're gonna work on. And they try to get it made into a law. The last, last year we ran this program, the cohort that went through it worked on re repealing the tampon tax. So um, many people don't realize that women, oh, is that? this is a gender <laughs> related <laughs> bill. Women is. only get taxed on tampons, which is something that is necessary for us, right? Completely. <laughs> So, wow. so, so repealing this tax would be good for women. It would be good for the economic status of women. That's what this cohort worked to try and get passed last year. It didn't get passed didn't get last passed. year. But as a matter of fact, uh, as of this taping, tomorrow uh, it's being heard in the House. And there are women from the Women's Policy Institute as, as well as just across the state who will be testifying on why this is a good idea to repeal this tax, this gender discriminatory tax. Cool. So those are, those are the things that the Women's Fund works on. That's a very simple tax to eliminate. Exactly. Completely. And, that, and, <laughs> and it's actually, gender and it, discriminatory. And, and absolutely, and also the message that it gives women too. Yes. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Wow. So we do a lot of different things, but our purpose, much like yours, Marianne, is is to help women succeed in our yes. state. Yes. Yeah. I think that's it. To, if you give women support, right, and you get them networked, and you that's the, even through the show, the women's business. The, the key is, I think, that will really give them the strength to go forward. Right. Because I think a lot of women that I spoke speak with and have spoke to in the past feel very isolated. Right. They feel like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm so lisa. How am I going to get through this? I have, you know, three or four kids and, and I'm married and I've got to get through this part of my life. And I still want to go into my education. But the minute you can tell them that they can, you support them, you'll be there for them, give you a conversation, honestly, the, that, that can sometimes just get them to the next step. Sure. Why are you, you of, um, teenagers dropping out of school? Like, why? I, so Today, it, it just is amazing to me at high school that we be losing, and I, I know the answer. I just want the listening audience to hear it. <laughs> I honestly, I can't speak to all the different mm. reasons. What I would say is, unfortunately, um, within our Latina community, you know, culturally, they're taught you should stay home, you should have a family, and so they're not taught what the value of school is. We would say at the Women's Fund, yes, you can, you absolutely, if that's what you want to do, is stay home and take care of your family, you should do that. But you also need need to be able to uh, plan for it properly from a financial standpoint. And in order to do that, when you're, you're not with kids, you should be, you know, saving money. You should be working. You can't get a good paying job unless you've got some basic, basic training, and that includes your GED or high school diploma. We would say that it includes at least some minimum certification, uh, perhaps in, in working in a health lab or just doing some, some computer work. If you have minimum certification that doesn't even require that you go to college, uh, this can help you get a good right. paying job for those times when times are lean yeah. so that you can adequately take care of your Thank family. You so if the message is in school, stay in school, school's important, we, and we, we do everything we can to keep you. If they go back at home and the message is leave school, drop out of school, that's conflicting for a teenager. Sure, sure. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, it, what I'm talking about is that's not the whole thing. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. I, 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 there I'm are saying, lots of different ri issues. Oh, there are lots, but how, how do we rise above this? Oh, you got to right. go into the family and change that culture. Is it going to happen with this group of teenagers coming up in the next 10 or 15 right. years? Like so I would say, I mean, there's lots of different ways to attack that problem. And again, I'm... The Women's Fund doesn't directly do those types of programs. Okay. We fund those we types fund of programs okay. right, yeah, uh, through grant making. Um, but I will say as a, a first generation college attending yeah. woman um, that I faced those challenges growing up within my own family. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, the pressures were there as I was growing up where I was told you really should stay home and take care of your family. It's wrong for you to go to college. And I had to fight against that. And I, you know, 
for me, I had a support network of friends and mentors who helped me through those, those tough times. My family came to support me afterwards. So I, I understand what it's like, particularly for first generation I students, totally to deal yeah. with that particular yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, see, I have the same story on 1970, high school, 69, you, you know, you're getting right at the graduation piece and tell my parents I'm going on to college. I'm like, literally, they said to me, you're a woman, you're not going to college. Right. It's not necessary. I'm like, what do you mean it's not necessary? Of course it's necessary. No. That's not necessary. You and need it to is, go to college. Yeah, college. It is and definitely I could never necessary have today. Ever seen me saying that to my daughter. Right. Ever. I mean, the minute I had a child, I totally flipped that over. Right. And it wasn't until actually we get out in the world and start talking to other people that college is okay for women. Right. Uh, and that's been my mission ever since. It's right. Like, you know, and I always say to a lot of women, one course at a time. Sure. See, community colleges, they're everywhere. They're absolutely wonderful. I live in Lincoln, so it was up the street from uh -huh. me. But one course at a time, just go and have right. them take this one course and see where it leads you. If you can get them through the door, sometimes self esteem is involved too. Do you absolutely. find that? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would agree with that as well. Um, mm. and, and so part of what we do is we teach women that they have power. Oh, wow. You know? <laughs> so, nice, nice. Uh, you know, because too often, again, we're told and taught, be quiet, be nice, don't ask for more than you should, <laughs> you know, don't brag. It, like, these are cultural types of things where... I can assure you I did not raise a daughter like that. <laughs> I'm so pleased <laughs> and to And I have had so many people say to me, she, she does a show with me, and I'm like, yes. <laughs> and actually, I'll say probably the first time I realized, and sometimes when you have a daughter, they become the voice that you couldn't be. Sure. Because you, can, you have all that access to them at all times. Yeah. And it's like, okay, no, you can say that. You don't have to do that. No, you can say no. Yes, you can do that if right. that's what you want. Right. And it's such a freedom for a mother to be able to do that, especially if you didn't have it in the culture as a kid, you know? And, you know, it's interesting political times. Um, yeah. I it is. It is. I took this job in November just as the election hit. Um, oh, well, and, so you're new at this. Uh, well, I'm new to the women's phone. Oh, no, yes. I'm just saying, you, you feel like you've been doing this for 10 years. <laughs> I feel like you're, you're my next dial on the phone if I want some information. <laughs> you've got it down. Congratulations. Well, thank you. I, you know, I think that I've probably been a feminist all my life. I get that. Um, I, and some people find that word to be a dirty word. Yeah, yeah, you know, I I, again, I, in fact, I had this conversation with my dentist last week. He said, oh, you're a man eater. And I was like, no, I'm married to a man. I love men <laughs> it's not about hating men it's about lifting women up absolutely yeah absolutely um, and I think a lot of just let me say men and women generally when they see even a young child or young girl be a sort of I can see some of them in the room just step back and say what's mouth that child right and I'm like you go girl you go right you right know, and it's not, but that was a I mean, once again it's I, I have grandsons I have granddaughters I, it has nothing to do with that it's just the way our culture teach Right. She's different people. Right. And then, and sometimes if it's a, a boy, it's it's okay to do that. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I, I think we still got a long way to go, but I want to believe we're pretty much there in many ways. Well, if we do nothing, if we do yeah. absolutely nothing, the gender wage gap will close by 2049. No way. Yes. If we, we do nothing. We got nothing. a long way to go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and remember, we're 45 out of, of 144 countries on the gender equity index. We've got we've got work to do. Um, the good news is, is you know, there are a lot of women who, like as I was starting to say when I, I took this job, the election hit. There are a lot of women who are suddenly realizing that they need to stand up and pay attention yes. for themselves and advocate for mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. And again, regar regardless of what your political affiliation is, the idea that women should become more involved in leadership, should be helping to drive decisions in the community is really, really important. For me, um, you know, that, that picture that made its way around the internet showing uh, as they were discussing health care for women and there were no women at the table discussing what national health care was going to be on health care for women. That's disturbing. Right, I, and that's something that really has to change. Absolutely. Right. Look at a lot of the um, different associations of well, and businesses you're in and look at the table sometimes. Right. It's usually three quarters men and a few women. It's you know what they say. And I'm saying they say, how can we get women to the table? Yeah. I think it's such an important part and it's like I wonder why they, they don't come but I, so, and sometimes I just don't understand it and sometimes it's not that they they maybe they're invited they're not invited okay they're not, because they're not seen they oh well there must not be anybody here 
Uh, See, and I think that's the, the persistence is sometimes you just got to step out. Which is, again, why we're saying yes, we're teaching women absolutely. about their power. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what they say, if, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> I like, I like I've never heard of that one before. So, yeah, we need to make sure women are at the table. Now, have you personally ever experienced gender inequality? Uh, I have, you know, and it, um, I would say that I have been pretty assertive throughout my life as well. I mean, mm -hmm. I talked to you about uh, being told that I needed to stay home and, and yep. take care of my family. Um, but I remember uh, distinctly when I was in college and I had just been elected as president of an honor society and the outgoing president was male and the dean of the program was male and I went to my first meeting with them and they talked over me and around me yes. and here I am ready to take over this organization and they did not include me in the yeah. conversation. It made me so angry. <laughs> and and I, I stood up for myself there, but it was wrong that it happened to begin yes, with. Exactly. Right. Yes. Yeah. Now I've got a few questions here to ask because we have like three minutes left. If you could go back in your childhood, someone who inspired you to be involved in this mission? Uh, you know, uh, I've I've been lucky to have some really great female role models. My my own mother was a single mom who you know had to wow. pull everything together wow. to take care of three girls. My husband's uh, mother is uh, was a woman of business who started several of her own businesses and traveled the the country speaking to lots of different groups. Um, I I loved her energy and she I think more than anybody from the work world gave me something to aspire to um, because before that I didn't see a lot of women in the workplace per se, um, at, at least not as actively and as in much of a leadership role as she was. So yeah, I, I've had some really great role models. Yes, you have, absolutely. How about if a young woman was starting business, what, what advice would you give? I, again, negotiate. Negotiate. Okay, negotiate. So, Should somebody, they take a course on negotiation? Or, you you know, know what? I'll be honest. I could add this to this okay. thing. You know what I do when I negotiate, and I, and I teach a lot of my staff that. What's that? We do role playing. Great. And I take on this side. Like, Absolutely. I'm going to be you, okay? Yeah. You're going to be what you want me to say. And I'll tell you, it's, it's if you can get someone to engage in that, Absolutely. it's like test it out, you know? And it work, kind of works pretty well. I, you know, you don't have to take the first offer that comes across the table. Mm -hmm. You can say, hey, thank you so much for that. I was hoping for X. Mm -hmm. Or I understand that you can't go up in the salary, but maybe you can give me a little more vacation time or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to take the first offer. Do your homework. Understand yes. what you know. Understand what the business you're getting into. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Know what the the realistic range is for salaries, and know your own worth. What are you bringing to the table? You're bringing something important. You advocate for that. Oh, advocate yes. for yourself. And if anyone wanted to get involved in the Women's Fund, how would they do that? I, certainly, they could go to our website. It's www. Dot WFRI, Women's Fund of Rhode Island, dot org. Lots of information there. Um, we'd love to have you get involved. And how could they get involved? Like, uh, what would you? Yeah, so we use volunteers on a variety of committees. Okay. We have a grant making committee, we have an advocacy committee, we have a fund development committee, and different events that are going on. Um, and if they want to do something that's more direct service, we can help connect them to other organizations that do that. So if they connect that. with you, you'll have something for them to that's do. That's right. Absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. It's been a great show. It's been a great show. Thank you so much. Thank you.